Tonight's episode is brought to you by Sherpa.com, SurvivalFeeling.com, and you, our listeners. And so I reached up to this physical piece of wood with paper on it, put my fingers upon it, and tried to zoom in. I don't care what you did today that made you feel stupid. You did not try to zoom in on a physical map. What is up, all of you Wayward Souls, and welcome back to the Wayward Stories podcast. Wayward Stories is the podcast where we tell stories, and we are still looking for your stories. If you guys have any cool stories of any adventures you've been on out there that you would like to share with us, please send us an email at mywaywardstory at gmail.com, or you can scooter over to the website, waywardstories.com, and you can use the contact form there, and while you're there, check out all of the cool stuff we have over there. Links to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all the good stuff. It's kind of like the nexus for all things Wayward Story. So if you're interested or are on any of those social platforms and would like to follow us over there, just go over to the website. Again, waywardstories.com. Best way to get to everything. Um, I hope you guys had a good holiday. Whether you be celebrating Christmas or Hanukkah as we did or any of the other traditions that exist throughout this giant planet of ours. Such a complex interwoven tapestry of different cultures and beliefs and it's just really cool to me. I love the winter season because there's a lot of stuff going on out there in the world. Mine was, um, you know, it was pretty good. It was pretty standard like we've talked about before and we're coming back with it today because this is just kind of the thing I do. Um... Holidays like this roll around. If you are one of the people out there in the world that maybe unfortunately no longer have like really family or whatever, you don't have anywhere to go, don't sit around and get depressed. Make your own reality. Make your own fun. Go out there and start your own traditions. And such as I did, basically out of necessity some four and a half years ago. And uh, it ended up being no different this time. I ended up with like a two day window right over the Christmas holidays where I did not have my daughter and I wasn't about to sit around here and feel sorry for myself with nothing to do while all the stores are closed and, you know, nobody's out doing anything and everyone's busy with their own Christmas, um, Christmas traditions and Christmas parties and family gatherings. And, you know, it can kind of leave you hung out to dry with nothing to do. And, you know, you can get depressed by that. So I find things to do. This Christmas adventure for 2021, Justin's 2021 Christmas tradition, um, I went out and I explored the abandoned mining town of Rush up in the uh, Buffalo Wilderness area up on the Buffalo River, in the Ozark National Forest. Um, and I really honestly, I'd heard of it. I'd heard of Rush. I've heard of the abandoned mining town of Rush. You see it on the Facebook, you see it on the interwebs, on, on Instagram. But I'd never really researched it um, because in my mind, I guess, abandoned mines, abandoned mining, that's really a Colorado thing. It can be kind of an Arizona thing. Um, my brain just never really connected to that, even though I love history as much as I do. And I love the Buffalo River and the Ozark Mountains in northwest and north central Arkansas as much as I do. I don't know why it just it really never came down the pipe for me as something that caught my attention until a couple of weeks ago. And I went and read up on it and I was kind of amazed. I was actually very much amazed and surprised and disappointed myself that I was unawares of the significance that Rush had to the state of Arkansas and also the United States nationally um, played a significant role in the America's efforts in World War I. Um, and yeah, it just also I was surprised by how much is there to see, how much is left over. Like, there's a lot to go see. There's a lot to explore. Like I say, like I say, very, very disappointed in myself as a history nerd living in this state that loves the very area so much that it resides in. Anyway. Anyway, I have existential shame now, and we're going to move on from that. But that's what we're going to talk about tonight, is the Rush Historic District and my adventure to it over um, the last couple of days. As you're listening to this, you're into mid-January, you've already got the uh, Christmas doldrums, and everything that you got um, for Christmas is already boring and setting in the garage or a cabinet somewhere. Um, but for me, this is fresh off. This is fresh off the adventure, recording ahead of time, because I'm going to have to go back to work. When you're listening to this... I will be somewhere in St. Louis again, being very, very sad that I am not at home and, you know, planning some adventures somewhere. 
But anyway, a couple of things I want to go over that are going to be kind of housekeeping-esque. One, you noticed at the very top, I said, brought to you by Sherpa.com. Why did I point that out? Because I got stuff that I want to tell you all about that I'm excited about. I was contacted by someone from Sherpa.com um, possibly a week ago or so. For you guys, it's been two or three, four weeks ago. Um, and talked to me about writing, doing write-ups, kind of travel blogs for their website about the state of Arkansas. Um, they did that through Instagram after coming across my profile. It's kind of like an influencer thing, and I've been contacted by many, many, many influencer things. And most of them are for really odd things. One of them is a particular product that, how do I say this? Let's just say that it has to do with lawn and manscape. And I just don't feel comfortable talking about my junk, your junk, anyone else's junk and, and how to properly. Um, yeah. Anyway, a lot of them are just scams and they're weird, but this one, it was like actually a website that actually hosts several places where you can, you know, write about adventures. And so they contacted me and I looked into it and talked to them on the phone. That was another thing. I actually talked to a human on the phone for about 20 minutes. So I'm pretty excited about it. I got several adventures up there now. So if you guys want to go check it out, see my writing, see some of the adventures I go on in a um, kind of an online vlog slash journal slash photo journalistic type of scenario, um, go to Sherpa.com, S-H-R-P-A, and look up Wayward Sun, and you'll find, find the adventures, including the one that we're about to talk about tonight. If you guys do go and check it out, please, by all means, like my post there and share them with all of your friends. Um, and keep an eye out. If you'll follow me, like there's going to be more coming. Like I've got a whole backlog that I'm going to be working into um, putting up there on the website. And then hopefully as my new adventures come along, I will continue to work forward into building that portfolio. Um, but I'm excited about it. Wanted to point that out. Number two thing I want to talk about tonight um, in housekeeping is just, I just got a rant about clickbait. Like ugh, clickbait drives me insane. Because it can be so incredibly misleading. And the whole reason I want to point this out, why is this coming up tonight, Justin? Because I went on right before I started recording tonight, and I pulled up a lot of information about Rush, Rush because I wanted to make sure, as I talk to you, as I always do, that I'm accurate. I'm telling the dates that things were discovered and things were abandoned, et cetera, et cetera. I want to you know, have good information to give you guys. As I'm looking down through the Google search results, the first couple of things I come across are only in your state.com and it says this abandoned ghost town in Arkansas will send shivers up your spine. And it was like put out like right before Halloween or something in some year, a couple of years ago. That is so incredibly misleading because there is absolutely nothing about Rush that is creepy in the least. And y'all, this did come from me. This come from a guy who likes creepy stuff. I believe in a lot of things or at least I think things can be plausible and I leave myself open to the possibility thereof. Like, I love that kind of stuff. There is nothing about Rush that is even remotely creepy. If you were standing in the buildings that remain extant in Rush in the middle of the night, say midnight under a full moon on October 31st, it still wouldn't be creepy. Because there's nothing creepy about it. It's not like some crazy buildings that are being overran by vegetation. And no, like it's well maintained. There are gates and fences everywhere where you cannot even enter the buildings, at least legally. If you do trespass, just be prepared for the consequences because they are pretty darn steep. They're pretty steep. Um, But like there's nothing there's nothing about it. They're just really cool old houses. It is very historic. Um. And very much intellectual in that sense. It feels very much scholarly when you're there. When you're looking at the buildings themselves, it doesn't feel like even in the least. The buildings themselves don't look creepy. Broad daylight, dark, doesn't matter. And I don't know why. It just it frustrates me. That is such that is so misleading and so silly. Like just to write articles, just to have content to put out. So you will click on the link and they can put as many ads in front of your face as they can. And it's just not true. And it makes you wonder how much of the crap that you see that does come across your timeline, because only in your state.com is a big deal. I see lots of that stuff. How much of it does somebody say maybe plan a trip? Say there's a lot of ghost hunters out there, a lot of paranormal people. How much people like put up together? I mean, I'm talking on principle here. This particularly is a silly example. But for the sake of this discussion, everyone puts together this big old trip to go out there and they drive out there and get there and it's dark and they get ready to do their thing and then realize there's absolutely nothing here that I can do legally anyway. And it's not even scary to look at. 
There's nothing about this that is even remotely creepy. And you just think about the other things. Go to this cave in your state and explore its whatevers. What if they're off limits? What if it's just like the buildings in Rush and you're not allowed to enter the cave? What if it's gated up? Most caves in Arkansas, for example, are. What if you can't even do the thing because you're simply writing to get ad clicks? Like, that's frustrating. Anyway, if you guys research Rush, you know, public service announcement, and you see where it says, this town is terrifying, it's creepy. Just know it's not. It's not even a little bit. It's super fascinating. It's super interesting. It's a great opportunity for some photography, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the hikes are great. The views are beautiful. You're right down on the Buffalo River. Nothing creepy about it. Just be forewarned. It's not something you're going to run into. Um, and shame on you. Shame on you. Only in your state. You capitalist pigs. By the way, I have my own website and trying to make this thing go. So, like, I'm not anti-capitalism. Just FYI. Save your emails. Don't need to hear about it. So let's get into it. The Rush Historic District. What was my adventure like? Y'all, there's, like, it's multifaceted. It was the way that I like to go on adventures. I had a main thing that I wanted to go do, which was explore Rush. Do the hiking trail, follow the interpretive trail, read all the signs, learn all about it I could right there on the spot and see it for myself. But also, what else can I do while I am in the place that's three hours from my home? I'm going to find a place. I'm going to stay the night somewhere. And what else is there to do? What is it else is there close by to see or photograph? Like, I'm kind of open to anything. You guys know me. I like photography. I like history. I like fishing. Like, there's a lot of stuff. A lot of things that I could do when I go somewhere. So you look into that. So I had multiple things that I actually did. Or let's say this. Multiple things that I enjoyed while I was there. And we're going to talk about all of those here tonight. So the Rush Historic District itself. Let's talk about that first. Zinc was discovered in the 1880s. Interesting story. Actually, some gentleman who found the first ore there thought it was going to be silver. Built an entire smelter, you know, like a stone masonry rockwork smelter that still stands there to this day. It's a very impressive structure. Um, standing all alone in the middle of this little open area where a bunch of buildings would have been in the past but are no longer. Only to process some ore and find that there was no silver in it. And that was kind of the end for them. It was kind of a bad deal. So that thing just got built for no real apparent reason and kind of, uh, you know, ruined those guys' fortunes. But somebody else figured out that that ore that they were looking at wasn't silver. It was zinc. Zinc was incredibly important way back in the day. I mean, I imagine it probably still is today, but it had more significance then as we will come to see. Um, but it was discovered in the 1880s and Rush boomed. It became a boom town deep, 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 deep in the Ozark Mountains, y'all. I mean, we're talking way down in there. Like that's one of the things when you go somewhere like this and you get down into it, you're like, this was not the easiest place to get to by car. Can you imagine doing it by wagon? On a horse, by foot, on a horse would probably be easier. But you're not just talking about getting yourself, your physical body there. You're talking about building buildings. You're talking about building structures, bringing in mining equipment. Those are the kinds of things that will kind of inspire awe and deep thought in you as you look around like, holy crap, I'm a snowflake. I am soft. I can't even imagine those guys and those ladies back then how hardy they were, how strong, how like, man, you know, they had, they had like their lives just compared to ours. We would be miserable trying to live their lives. Um, I think that's why a lot of us love to go backcountry camping and get into that kind of stuff is almost to get back in touch with that, that part of us. But it's, it's just insanity how far down in there, how secluded it is. It's absolutely beautiful. It's an amazing place. Um, but anyway, it, it, Boomed through the 1880s into the 19 teens and 1920s. It hit its peak, its heyday during World War I because zinc was incredibly important to the um, cause, the war cause. Um, and in and of itself kind of started to recede all the way until World War II, at which point any of you that do like history are aware Everything was rationed in the United States. Like there wasn't, they, we needed all the metal we could get. So metal was taken for scrap. It was essentially dismantled. The greatest part of Rush, all the mines and the mining equipment was all taken for scrap for the most part. Um, and then that kind of was close to the end. It, it hung on another 10 or 20 years until the final residents left. And after the final residents left and it was truly abandoned and declared a ghost town, the National Park Service basically took over administration of it as a part of the Buffalo 
National River, Scenic Riverway, because it's right down on the river. So it is a National Parks administered site, and it is well-maintained. As such, it is well-maintained, um, well-preserved, and there's a lot left. There's several buildings left there standing that would have been homesteads and even a general store that is in and of itself starting to collapse. But all really cool structures and really great opportunities for, for photography. Um, it lives right down in the heart of the Ozarks, deep down in the hollers, as we like to say around here. And it's a really fascinating place. One of the things I found about it was how much it resembled the, the, the abandoned gold and silver mines that I explored in central Colorado last year or over a year ago now. Um, it, it looked just like it. Even the mountains themselves. Yes, not as dramatic as the Rockies, so to speak. You don't have 14,000 foot mountains around you. You've just, it's still dramatic. There's still beautiful scenery. It looks, I mean, honestly, it felt like I was back in Colorado. And that, to me, is part of the beauty of this. It really is a place right here close to home that we in the state of Arkansas, southern Missouri, surrounding areas, we can go and explore and really kind of get a taste of, you know, something that's a much longer trip to access. Like it, it reminded me so much of being in Colorado. It was just absolutely stunningly gorgeous up there. So what is the best way to explore Rush? In this author's humble opinion, this host's humble opinion, um, there's actually a couple of ways. There's a hike that you can take and then there's also kind of a little bit of a driving tour. Some of the more significant things to see with your eyeballs are really right along the road that follows Rush Creek down to the Buffalo River, down to its confluence with the Buffalo. Um, and I kind of did both. That's the that's the tact I took is because I want to see it all. Like I'm going up here for this weekend adventure away. Like I want to take in all that I can. I want to get as much data before I leave here, as much intellectual information, as many photographs, as much video as I can and squeeze out all the content I can to come back and share with all of you guys about this really amazing place that our beautiful home state, the natural state of Arkansas has. Um, so I went through both ways. I got, I showed up early in the morning. That was one of the first things I did. Got up early from where I stayed. We're going to talk about that later. Got up early from where I stayed, drove down into Rush. About a 23-minute drive south of Yellville. I stayed in Yellville um, and rolled into the Buffalo River Valley. I want to say it was around 9 a.m., maybe 8.50, 9 a.m. Sun still barely peeking into the valley. That's one of the things. Sunrise and sundown come very late and very early, especially in the winter, especially on Christmas, the shortest day of the year. Um, because the mountains are so high and you're so deep in the valley and that alone provided a really, really beautiful, um, image to greet me as I arrived, pulled into brush and they're the main old homes, the main old buildings that are still extant are right along the right side of the dirt road. You're driving up and there's all this fog rolling up because it was like 28 degrees when I got there, the sun's starting to peek into the valley and there's all this fog rolling off of any source of water. There's fog hanging all throughout the valley and it was kind of playing along throughout the buildings and offered some really great opportunities to get footage or pictures right when I showed up. So what I did is I checked out those first few buildings. I read a couple of the signs, kind of got oriented, drove on down and saw everything there was to see along the drive down to the river. Right before I got down to Rush Landing and where um, the confluence of Rush Creek and the Buffalo are, which is another parking area and another place that you can start the hike from, I came across this very large volume of water springing from the ground just to the right of the road. Even shows on the topo maps as a spring. And it created a really, really, really amazing opportunity for footage and for photographs. If you guys are listening to this, Go over to youtube.com forward slash wayward stories and the video that's labeled um, Rush, Arkansas's own abandoned mining town, whatever. You can't miss it. You will get to see the footage very early into the video. Within the first two minutes of the video, you can see this footage of the steam rising off the fog, rising off of the water, off of this stream of spring that is rolling into Rush Creek. Absolutely beautiful. And I got a couple of images there that that go up at the very top of my list of pictures I've ever been able to capture. Super, super happy with those results. You can see those on my Instagram as well, Wayward Sun 119. You guys can check all that out. But 
It was a beautiful place early in the morning to get photographs, and I suspect most mornings, especially in the winter, it's a pretty good opportunity for to- photography for you guys to take into account if you ever plan a trip like this. Um, so we did that. I checked that out, got my photos, got my footage, and then I headed on down to Rush Landing Park, check it out, decide how I was going to go about it. So what I ended up doing, there's a couple of ways you can explore the hiking portion of this adventure. Okay, the the road portion is simple enough. It can happen in just a few minutes and you can see some very significant remains. There's I believe it was the Macintosh Mill remains are very significant, very interesting rock work that's left. All the substructure, the frame, everything, all of that is gone. I think the main mill building looks like it burned, judging by everything that was laying around at some point in history. But the rock work itself, the masonry work is still incredibly significant. It's from another time. Like it's, it's really neat to check out, but the hiking portion, you can either start the morning star area, which is right at say rush proper, which is where the main buildings that exist right along the road are, or you can start from the other end, which is down at rush landing. What I chose to do because the hike itself can be attacked in two ways. You can leave morning star, come all the way down to rush landing, and then take a left up around the hill to go to another Um, mine, one of the more significant ruins that's left to explore, and then come right back down and go back to where you came from and make it an out and back. And it's about a two and a half to three mile hike that way. The alternate route, which you can go and find on all trails, is to take that, go all the way up, go all the way up to the the, um, Monte Cristo mine, which is the one that would be the furthest end of your trip, and then bushwhack your way back across the top of Rush Mountain. Um, in according to all trails, you can go read it for yourself. Um, it's the Rush Mining Loop Trail. If you go check it out on all trails, it tells you blatantly right up front it's bushwhack back across the mountain. If you continue past Monte Cristo Mine, it is not marked. It is not blazed. It is not a well trodden trail. It is just something someone decided. Yo. It'd be way easier to just hop back across the top of the mountain right here to where I started as opposed to going all the way back around everything I just did. Um, so I honestly, unless you're very adventurous type, I don't know that I would suggest going that way. It looked like it was going to be a very um, strenuous task to basically trek, just trek, bushwhack your way across the top of this mountain. It probably would have been beautiful, and you may find some things up there that are very interesting to see because there are mines that dotted the entire landscape down there. It was a big operation, y'all, back in the day. I mean, it used to be in, like, Harper's Weekly, like, information about all the, the boom in Rush, Arkansas. Like, it became nationally known and nationally respected. It was a big dang deal. It's a big dang deal. Just because it's not gold or silver, you know, it doesn't get as much of the limelight as the gold and silver rushes, of course. But it was the same kind of scenario. It brought people from all over the country, immigrants from all over. And they're actually paid pretty dang significantly well for the time. Turn of the century, like 35 cents an hour. Like, I mean, I need to go brush up on my history before I start talking out my, my rear end. But I'm pretty sure 35 cents a day would have been good money around the turn of the century and some of the factories and things that were going on with the Industrial Revolution. Um, But they had 35 cents an hour and had a booming town and there was stuff. That whole mountain was just dotted with mines. So if you go the bushwhack route, it may be really fascinating, probably be good exercise, probably be a pretty rough go. Um, That's an option for you and you can download that trek from all trails. But for me, I decided to go back the way I came. And even explore a little more because there's a couple of ways you can do that. You can come up the trail that is marked and blazed, or you can literally follow the old road that went to the Monte Cristo mine and followed along um, Clabber Creek, which goes up that arm of the valley and down to the confluence with the buffalo and then walk up the buffalo back to Rush Landing. Essentially the same hike, but just, you know, a few hundred yards separates the two and some elevation change. And if you do it that way, make it like its own loop, you get to see a lot more. Like you can see along the terrace of the mountain as you go up to Monte Cristo. And when you come back down, follow the old road where the two diverge. And you want to talk about y'all. You want to talk about some absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous views of this Clabber Creek. Crystal, painfully clear water. Like I'm talking so crystal clear that in places, if you were high enough above it, it looked like there wasn't water in the creek. And I'm not making this up. I'm not exaggerating. There was at least one vista where I looked down 
And I was like, I think the creek's dry, but with enough sunlight glinting and look hard enough, you could tell, no, there's water in that creek. It is really, truly, honestly, that crystal clear, which is, you know, significantly different from the buffalo, which carries a, a iconic green color. It's kind of known for that. It's kind of like the mulberry. Um, and it has to do with the minerals that exist in those art mountains and the geology that the rivers cut through. But they kind of, have a, they're very clear but they have a real green, pretty green tint to them. This water was crystal clear, just like Rush Creek's water was. But you'll get some really good looks at some neat rapids if you follow the old road back down. And there's a lot of infrastructure along that road, old abandoned infrastructure, the kind that actually is being eaten by the vegetation of the of the forest growing back, you know, 60 years after all of this was scrapped and abandoned. Um, and then... After you make that entire loop and explore all the stuff up to the Monte Cristo, back down Clabber Creek, you can cop back in your car, if you like, and you can drive back to the Morningstar area, Rush Proper, where the town itself once existed, and then you can start the hike from that end and do a down and back, and in and out. Um, or you can stay there at Rush and do the trail down to Morningstar and then come back to Rush Landing. Either way, it's an out and back as opposed to a loop. If you want to do it, what I would say is the safer and probably more preferable way. Um, for those of us that aren't as adventurous or perhaps like me, that maybe get a little bit older. Maybe, maybe I don't want to go up there and blow my knee out on the side of the mountain trying to climb over a damn crevasse somewhere. Anyway, when you take the hike from Morningstar, because that's essentially what I did. Right, but before we do that, before we do that, I'm going to make you guys feel a little bit better about yourselves. Did you like spill coffee in your lap this morning or last week and think, God, that was so stupid. And you had to go change clothes. And like, have you done something recently that made you feel not so great about yourself? Like we're pretty hard on ourselves as humans. We all are. Well, let me make you feel better about yourself. I'm about to throw myself under the bus. As I stood and pondered at the head at brush landing at the mouth of the trail, Looking at the board that is provided by the National Park Service, a physical, tangible, like printout on a piece of wood on a trailhead. And I was looking at, okay, well, here's this mine and here's this mine and here's this ore house and this is the remains of this and this. And how do I want to go about this? And there was one particular area I wanted to look at real close. Um, it's the Macintosh area, Macintosh mine area, Macintosh mill. I wanted to see how close is it? Is it better to access it from the road? Or is it better to access it from the hiking trail across the, the bench of the mountain? And so I reached up to this physical piece of wood with paper on it, put my fingers upon it, and tried to zoom in. I don't care what you did today or yesterday or last week that made you feel stupid. You are not stupid because you did not try to zoom in on a physical map. Anyway... It's good. It's good to stay humble. That's why I throw myself under the bus to you guys sometimes. It's good to stay humble. Don't need to be taking ourselves too seriously. Now do we? This world's too serious as it is. Um, but yeah, so after I did that and and I sit there and stared at that map and felt rather, rather foolish for a moment, I uh, decided it was time to get started on the hike. So what I chose to do personally is I made my little loop up to Monte Cristo and back and I said I'm going to drive back up I will stop at the Macintosh mill what's left of it explored it super super cool um there's some really good pictures to be taken there for you photographers the um the rock work the masonry work like there's a lot of stuff you could do macro photography there's a lot of things that you could set up there especially if you played the time of day right if you got there closer to the sunset in the valley there will be a lot of really interesting plays on light, especially there's one place where it's almost like an old schoolhouse. Any of you guys that have ever come across the remnants of the rock walls around the old schools that had like the stairs cut into each of the four cardinal directions of the wall that surrounded the whole property. There was something similar to that right about where I believe it was the Macintosh Mill was located and it the light was falling just right through the tops of the trees on the top of the ridge and it actually created like a natural vignette and I was able to take advantage of that and that to me really cool picture a lot of people wouldn't appreciate it it doesn't look like much to a lot of people but to me I was like that y'all that that is artsy fartsy right there and I'm about it um so there's some great opportunities for that and as you drive on back up you get to the Morningstar area there's a good trailhead good parking spot 
a little pavilion, covered pavilion that you can set in the shade if it's warm weather, you know, and stay out of the sun for a minute um, and start your hike from there. Now, when you come out of there, I'm talking right out of the gate, you come up to what was the Morning Star Mill ruins and they are impressive. There's a lot of them to check out. There's a lot to look at there and a lot to photograph. There's some really good photographic opportunities there and a whole lot of history to stand in, stand and look at and explore and check out. Um, and if you go on up a little bit more, another maybe 50 yards, and then there's a little cut to the left and there's the old blacksmith shop. Highly suggest going to check it out because it is well preserved. It's in great shape. Inside of this little fence, you can get real close to get pictures of it. You can see the old shelves that were built into the walls inside of this building. Um, for storage, you can actually see the actual blacksmith's forge, what's left of it, and the pipe hanging through the ceiling from the smokestack above the forge. Um, all of the things like the what would have been essentially like to us a range hood or a vent hood. I don't know what it's technically properly called in a blacksmith shop. That piece is missing, but you can see where the pipe came down to the point where there would have been a fitting and there would have been this larger hood to take in all of the fumes from the forge. Um, really interesting stuff. Lots of foundational ruins everywhere to see. And then there are, of course, in fact, the mines themselves. When you start on up from the blacksmith's forge, you kind of immediately have a pretty significant elevation gain. It is not a hard elevation gain. Y'all, I would say that it's at best, at the very most, be a moderate rated trail for that portion of the trail. It's not bad at all. It's just going to make your glutes burn. It's just going to put a little burn in your butt. That's all it's really going to do. It's a pretty good hike. It's a pretty well-maintained trail. It is well used. It is well marked. You can't miss it. You can't lose that trail. The, the mining loop trail, you can't lose it once you're on it. Um, save the Monte Cristo spur but the loop itself very well marked very well maintained um you got an elevation gain right out of the box not a huge one i didn't go and i should have went and looked it up i didn't go and look it up um the hike itself is only like going to be close to three miles there and back like a mile and a half each way um but you take care of that elevation gain and get it out of the way and you're suddenly on the level where i'm assuming all the ore deposits were found because almost all of the mines are along this one essential elevation of the top of the ridge of this mountain. There are so many, there are so many mines. All of them have huge iron bars concreted in and worked into the rock at the opening of the mines. You cannot enter any of them. They're all closed in the state of Arkansas. Um, I'm sure public safety is probably the number one consideration, but also they blame it on white nose syndrome and the bats. And I do know as a person who believes in science and believes in biology um, and doesn't think that everything the government tells us is complete and total conspiracy, though I don't trust you, U.S. government, in so many ways. I have so many problems with you. But I do believe the white nose syndrome is actually a legit issue, a legit biological issue. And, you know, y'all don't know what kind of trouble we in. If all the bats die off, if we extinct bats the way we extincted a lot of other animals and got damn near close to extincting others, y'all, it changes ecology things that you wouldn't like, especially you outdoorsmen. You're listening to this. You're an outdoorsman. You know what you wouldn't like? Friggin' big black flies and biting flies and gnats and mosquitoes eating you alive everywhere you go. Do you know what eats those? Bats eat those. Bats keep those populations in check. So I'm all for the bats personally, because I don't like mosquitoes that much. They're itchy. Um, but they're all gated. And when I say gated, I'm talking big, huge iron bars. You ain't getting in. Unless you're a shapeshifter, you ain't getting in there. Um, and most of those even have another chain link fence built outside of that. So you can't even really get to the mouth. And that was a little disappointing. I would have loved to have been able to stick my camera through the bars with a flashlight and actually see some of the interior of the cave right from the mouth. But that wasn't an option. Um, but they dot this mountain. They're everywhere. And they're in really fascinating settings too. Some of them like you can see a trail that goes up like the side of the mountain a little ways off trail. You can't really see what's up there. But you know, there must be a mine up there. So I climbed up to one of them. That was the one that really struck me like, man, this is literally like being back in Colorado. Literal. That is the wrong way to use the word literal. I just use literally completely wrong. For all you wordsmiths out there, at least I caught it. Um, but that's the one place that the most resembled and really, really brought the thought 
and the the comparison of when I was in Colorado to mine. Um, you get up in there, there's this hole cut in the side of a crag into a, a indention in the side of these bluff faces. You turn back and you look and it's just, I don't know, man, it's the way the dirt and the gravel and the grass and the underbrush and you're looking out and it's just a sudden drop and then there's a precipice and then there's a vista and another vista and in the distance you see the blue silhouettes of mountains. The views on this hike, y'all, the views alone are worth it. I mean, this is really, truly kind of the tell of two experiences. Going to rush, it could be three, but for my purposes right now in the dead of winter, two purposes, two two different experiences. One of them is a beautiful, absolutely standalone by itself. Take the history out of the mix. Beautiful hike. It stands by itself as a beautiful hike with beautiful views and beautiful vistas. And then the other is the historic experience to be able to walk amongst one of Arkansas's abandoned ghost towns in a significant mining district for not just Arkansas, but the United States of America and so much of the history left there to be seen. That's what's real to me. That's what really gets me when you're standing in the walls of an abandoned ore mill that played a significant role in American history and World War I and all of these different things, any kind of history, not even here in Rush, just any history, and you can stand there in it and touch it. Those rock walls are the same rock walls that were there 150 years ago, 140 years ago in 1800s and early 1900s, 120 to 150 years ago. You can touch and put your hands on the same wall that one of your maybe possibly ancestors. I just did my ancestry.com thing. We will have to talk about that in the future a little bit, but I just found out a whole lot of my DNA and a whole lot of my ancestors. And I never knew this, never knew this. I had thought I had a story of who and what I came from um, that was backed by actual genealogical research, but it was genealogy in the 1990s. And I guess apparently that was sketchy and a little bit suspect, but a good portion of my heritage came from Mountain Home, Yellville, all the places in Northwest Arkansas, like these settlers, these very settlers like Rush, where I was, the very same settlers that were in those kinds of areas, in those small towns, in those kinds of places. That's like my forebears and a lot of y'all's forebears. Like we all related anyway, when you get right down to it. It's fascinating to me that you can stand there and put your hands on on a hewn rock wall that maybe one of your ancestors built. Their hands, their physical hands touched it. It's like being in two different times, y'all. It's kind of like bending the rules of time and space in a weird metaphorical way when you think about it. You're standing in a place out of time. You, yourself, right here, currently today, are standing there. But something from a time, long distant, still remains. And there's a tangible link to it. And you stand within it. And that, to me, is just fascinating. That, to me, stirs the mind it stirs the emotions of like just almost childlike wonder i don't know i don't know i don't have the right words for it right now for someone who talks as damn much as i do i don't have the words for it i have to give that some thought and get back to you in the future perhaps but it's it evokes a lot of really cool thoughts a lot of deep thought about our history and our who we are as people um and there's so much of that to see when you go up and you see these minds and you see all this. But that's kind of your two experiences. This is two different experiences, a beautiful hike and an awesome look at some really significant history. And the two get to go together like it's 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 a two for one deal. Y'all two for you because one won't do. That's how we roll wayward stories. That's how we roll in the state of Arkansas. Like, you know, you always going to get more than you bargained for when you come come hang out with us. Um. And there's so much more. Like I said, if we were doing this in the summer, I mean, it could be three different experiences. You can go down and you can spend your day fishing and floating in the beautiful Buffalo River. Um, And that alone, that alone is a trip for anyone to make. Y'all, I've done it. God, there's no count to the number of times I've done the Buffalo River from the upper all the way down to the lower. Overnight trips, day trips, fishing trips, just party trips back when I was younger. The Buffalo is a wonderful, wonderful place. And we're probably going to cut. We're probably going to go over a lot of the trips I took in a future episode coming up here real soon. I've been been thinking a lot about that here lately. But yeah, just going down to Rush, y'all. It's a real adventure. You're a ways from really anything. I mean, you're 20 something miles south of Yellville, which is one of the closest little communities that exist in the area. Like you're down in the mountains, y'all. You are in National Park's administered lands. You are part of the Buffalo Wilderness Area. It's out there. It is a great day trip. 
It's great for the history. It's great for the hike. You can hang out the picnic tables down at Rush Landing to have your lunch. You know, you can, there's so many ways that you can, you can approach this, but the photography opportunities are there, y'all. The opportunities for a great hike, some great cardio, um, the opportunities to learn. If you do like to learn about history, there's just, it's got a lot to offer. This one little single trip that I, I mean, you could do like a half day trip and just, if you're just going out there to bang out the hike, you could do it in the morning. You could do it in an afternoon. For me, I was able to easily turn it into a full day adventure because number one, I'm checking out the history. I'm trying to make the video for the YouTube channel. I'm trying to get the pictures to put on Instagram and for my personal, you know, portfolio and for my, well, for this um, new Sherpa.com thing that I've got going on. I've got so much going on and I'm taking in two to three different things and I'm looking for all these different opportunities for photos, for learning about the history, to be able to tell the story of it more effectively and for this podcast to come back and turn this into an hour worth of talking about what you can see and what you can do. I easily turned it into a full day trip and it was a great full day, a day I enjoyed thoroughly. I want to take a second to tell you guys about tonight's sponsor, Survival Feeling. Survival Feeling is a hiking brand based in Greece, and they offer an assortment of gear that's aimed towards the goal of helping you better enjoy your time outside. And that is, of course, what we are all about here at Wayward Stories. I really like this company for a lot of reasons, but chief amongst them is that they were founded with giving back to the community in mind. They donate a portion of all proceeds to organizations like the Wildland Firefighters Foundation to help support those who work to keep us all safe while we're out there trying to find ourselves. We've partnered with them to bring you guys a unique coupon code that will save you wayward souls 15% off of your order. Go to survivalfeeling.com and use offer code waywardstories at checkout. Once again, that's survivalfeeling.com and use the offer code Wayward Stories. Let's talk about the next couple of things I did. Um, and, you know, where you could stay in Yellville, where you can, some other things that you can go do. I want to talk about those a little bit. So you guys get a full kind of itinerary, some ideas of what you can do up in this area. One of the notable things, believe it or not, y'all, not a lot of waterfalls in real close driving distance to this. That might shock you. Any of you that do like me and you pull up the old Google Maps all the time and you blow up the north part of the state and type in waterfalls and you're going down your checklist of ones you've seen, ones you've gotten photos of, ones that you've been to but the water wasn't running and you got to go back. There is an interesting void of waterfalls that are known in this general area. Um, Of course, I say that Somebody going to write in and tell me how stupid I am because there's probably like a whole bunch of them that are in like Tim Ernst's book. Um, I need to look into that, get into a little more depth research. But, you know, on the fly, quick, easy way to look is on Google Maps because almost there's so many of our waterfalls are already on there. So I look and I was like, I was a little disappointed in that. Just kind of oddly enough, found it. We had like three inches of rain and 24 hours last week up in that area. Everything was flowing really good. Opportunities to get to some of these creeks and waterfalls while they're flowing for the waterfalls, it can be tough when you live three hours from the area. Like having the right day off, the rainfall fell at the right time in the last, you know, whatever time period, it can be tough. I had a cloudy day today. I was like, man, coming home, maybe I can hit some waterfalls. It just didn't work out that way. Didn't work out that way. But that was odd. I thought it odd. The closest thing that I really wanted to get was over an hour and a half away. Um, And that was Mirror Lake Falls. A lot of that's due to not the distance as the crow flies. A lot of that's due to the distance as you have to drive along ridges and valleys and switchbacks and all of these things trying to get from one place to to the other in the ever dramatic, ever beautiful Ozark Mountains. Um, But there are a few things to do up there. One of them, again, which I did not do this trip because I had other things going on, but fishing. You can absolutely get down there on the Buffalo River and catch some awesome smallmouth and largemouth bass. There's all kinds of fishing, but that's just kind of a quick aside. What I ended up doing, did the whole day, got all my stuff together, you know, got all the videos, got all the pictures I wanted, was kind of building my narrative, got out there and got my hike in, got all the history, all that stuff. Came back, 23 minute drive back into Yeleville to the place that I stayed. Now where I stayed, I need to talk about the place I stayed because this might be something for you guys. Number one, you could just stay at Rush. If you're the camping kind, and I normally am, but like, Right now, Christmas, and it's like it was like 20 something degrees the other morning. I've done that in the past. Y'all, I've turned 41 in November. Things hurt now. Things ache. Things creak. I've, like I said, 
I earned my street cred long ago doing far crazier stuff than throwing out a hammock when it's 12 degrees outside. I really need to do that. I'd rather sleep in a bed sometimes when the weather's very extreme, which right now, 12 degrees overnight's pretty damn cold. Um, But I stayed at this little hotel. And that's part of the reason I stayed was for this Sherpa.com deal. Like the point is to get five or six points of interest on a little day trip so you can write together, you know, put together an author, an article about this little travel adventure. So that was part of the thought press process going into this. There's this little hotel in Yellville and it's called the Carlton Marriott. Now I'm going to be completely straight, honest with you guys. It is not the Ritz Carlton. Do not confuse the two. It's the Carlton Marion. There is a somewhat significant difference in the two. The Carlton Marion, though, I am not going to dog on because it was extremely affordable and it was clean. It is quite dated. I felt like I was in, on vacation in 1986, um, but it was clean. It's small. Um, it's very compact. It's not the most super comfortable bed you'll ever be in, but it's a nice, clean little hotel to stay in. Um, very well kept, even though, again, not necessarily completely updated. Well kept. It's not a crack hotel, y'all. That's all I'm saying. It ain't a roach motel. It ain't a crack motel. It was pretty nice. Pretty nice little place for the 60 bucks a night you're going to pay for it. And they have a view. You go out behind that guy and you walk down to the ledge. It's maybe a hundred yard little walk over a mowed grassy area i mean it's not even like a hike it's nice and clear like a rolling hill that goes down to a ledge you get down to the ledge and it's like a straight drop to crooked creek and i bet crooked creek's 100 feet below you if not more it is a beautiful vista it is a beautiful vista to the south this view is to the south the sun is rising on your left or it's setting on your right crooked creek is snaking along the ridge line below you off into the distance there's fields in the distance with cows wandering in the fields and i'm talking way distant y'all they're many many miles away and you can see the little dots out there absolutely beautiful sunset views absolutely beautiful morning views like i went up and got out or got up and went down there um, the morning that I woke up and it was so cold outside and there was heavy frost on all the trees, heavy frost on the ground. And I got some really, really great pictures of the sunrise out over this frozen looking valley. Um, you can go check those out on Instagram as well. Like it's got an amazing view for when you're just kicking it. They've got some really cool lights strung up everywhere that are on timers. So you can go out there and sit around this nice fire pit with the lights strung up and drink you an adult beverage or whatever it is you like to drink while you sit around the fire and cook s'mores. Um, it was a nice, neat little place. And I mean, I'm not trying to oversell them, but it is significant to me in that most small hotels that you find in small towns, and I'm not being judgy here, I'm being real, having grown up in small towns with these kinds of little hotels. They're usually not the place that you want to be found. You don't want to be there. It's not good for you in any way, shape, or form. You might end up caught in a drug sting. There's so many things that could go wrong. This was not one of those places, and that's why I want to point it out. It's small. It's older, like those kinds of places, but it's well-kept, well-maintained. It's clean. It's partially updated, not completely. It was a nice place to stay for really, really on the cheap for a touristy type of place. Um, so it's something that you guys can check out. Like I actually very much enjoyed my stay there. It was um, quite functional and the view, the view was amazing. So I go back and I get all my stuff put together and I get all my photos dump. I do a big photo dump and a video dump and get everything sent to my iPad and kind of just do a little bit of like cleanup, a little bit of OCD for all the things I've taken and put them into their respective folders so that I can come back at them later cleanly and start going through calling pictures, editing pictures, calling video, editing video. And after I got all that done, you know, it was about dinner time. So I went down and ate at this place called the Black Sheep Barbecue. Got a cool vibe. It's a cool vibe little place. Um, they had some awesome barbecue. I had a burger. The burger was great. Um, it's really good food, really cool atmosphere, really cool vibe. There's a couple of other places in town that you can also eat. One of them is a pizzeria, and then there is a Mexican restaurant right across the street from the Black Sheep Barbecue. So you've got like three places in Yellville that you can chow down, including actually there's a Sonic just down the road too. So And there's also a Dollar General. So like most of the basic amenities of a small town these days out in the middle of nowhere, there's a subway, there's a Dollar General. Y'all remember used to, it was McDonald's and Walmart. Every town, 
everywhere. Had a Walmart and a McDonald's. Y'all may not have noticed this. As a delivery driver who's gone through many, many, many tiny communities all over the United States now, like Subway and Dollar General have taken over that that torch. Every small town has got a Subway and a DG. But anyway, if you need any little sundry items, you got a Dollar General. If you need some food, there are places to eat. But again, I highly suggest the Black Sheep Barbecue because it's barbecue for one thing. Great atmosphere, very tasty food. Um, and really to wrap up, This episode, with the last real event that occurred, the last real thing stop that I took, came to my attention that I was only 12 minutes from the Cotter Bridge. Cotter Bridge is a historically significant bridge across the White River, um, 12 minutes from Yellville, and it is absolutely stunningly beautiful. The architecture of it. It actually said online, I did some research, I went to historicbridges.com and found, um, information, some good factual information about it. And according to historicbridges.com, they say it is the most impressive and historically significant um, example of a bridge of that kind. I think it was called a marsh bridge. It was concrete, poured spandrel type of bridge. It's, I'm not a bridge engineer. But anyway, it's very, very Art Deco. 1920s. It was actually built in 1930, but I know Art Deco was 20s, 30s. Very Art Deco, poured concrete, got all these freaking awesome arches, and it actually looks and probably functions, if we're being honest, like a suspension bridge, but everything's poured concrete. It's very aesthetically beautiful. It is aesthetically pleasing. Um, So, like, it's just, like, 12 minutes away, and it's known for its picturesque quality and how they light it up. It remains lit up at night over the White River, and I thought, man, yeah, that we should go check that out. That'd be a great little trip. Just 12 minutes down the road, go see if I can get some night photography, get some pictures of this bridge spanning the river at night. Like, you know, the first thing you think as a photographer is, man, we're going to have lights reflecting off the water. There's a lot of potential to this kind of photograph. Go over there. And awesomely enough, it's Christmas time. So they've got it lit up in Christmas colors. There's greens and there's reds. And honestly, got one of the better pictures. Not maybe one of the better. Maybe not one of the better. It's one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken. And like funny story about that. I take this picture, right? I took, I only took maybe a dozen. It was freezing outside and I was cold wearing basketball shorts and a hoodie. I actually got cold. Typically I don't, but I take these pictures. I get 10 or 12 and just looking at them on the LCD screen. I was like, oh man, these are all killer. These are all killer. These are going to be great photos. So I only took a dozen get back, dump them on the iPad, get them full size. You know, there was only one out of the 12 that I was truly pleased with. There was probably four out of the 12 that I could have done something with, but there was only one. There's always that one. If you take enough pictures, guys, this is for any of you photographers or new photographers or or aspiring photographers out there. Take way too many. My ratio used to be 100 to 1. I would take 100 photos and I am really hard on myself. To be fair, I'm super hard on myself and super picky about my own work. But it took me roughly, it was just something that kind of peaked its head up over time. I picked up the pattern. It's like, I'll take two or 300 photos for every time I go on a little adventure. And I get two or three that I'll actually edit into final format and put out there for the world to see. It's one in a hundred was my ratio. Take way more than you think you're going to need. Try different angles. Change your perspective. Like that was the big story about taking pictures at this Cotter Bridge last night. If I was too far to the right, like to give you an example a really good way to take pictures of bridges is far more perpendicular to it, like parallel. If you can get closer beside it where the bridge is coming in from frame right or left, whatever, coming in from side frame and takes your eyes into the center of the picture and fades into the distance, that is a great angle on a bridge. I've got several pictures of bridges framed just like that, and they're good pictures. This one, it wasn't working. Yeah, the lights on the bridge looked nice, But from that angle, there was no reflection of all these beautiful colors on the water. If I went far more broadside, I got this beautiful play of light on the water. Colors, reds and greens, just basically dancing all the way up to almost me. Stand right on the shore of the water. And it gave it almost a painting-esque quality to it, the lights in the water. So like, Play with angles. Take more pictures than you think you're going to need. Change your angles. Change your perspectives. Get low to the ground. Get high. Get to the left, to the right. Take a lot of pictures and pull out of there the ones that really stand out to you as really solid pictures. So anyway, I take these 12 pictures. 
Only one of them really met my approval with like, okay, this is the one. Oh man, I'm digging this picture. I was pretty hot on it. And I started messing around with it and made sure that everything was level. That's a big deal. Trying to level your camera at night wasn't easy. I had to get it on plane so that stuff in the background didn't look crooked. And got it put together and just go in and slap it on Arkansas Pictures um, Facebook group. It's got like 63,000, I think, or 66,000, 63,000 members. And I go and throw it into Arkansas Pictures because I was like, man, that's a cool picture. I thought that it would probably be one of like a dozen because it's a very photographed bridge in Arkansas. It's a historically significant, beautiful structure. It's Christmas time. They got it lit up with Christmas lights. People who live up in North Arkansas and central Arkansas, this is something they're going to know. I wasn't fully aware of that. Something they're going to know. So I assumed I'm going to go in here. I'm going to throw this picture in. It's going to be one of a dozen that people have already planted. No, apparently not. And everyone was pretty psyched about it. And like 20 minutes later, I realized that the admin of Arkansas Pictures, this group with 63,000 people in it, has made it the cover photo for the group. Like, that was that was crazy. I laughed really hard for some time because I was like, holy cow, I'm putting this picture out there thinking this is a really neat picture. This came out really good. Yeah, there'd be a few people that are going to like this. And like half hour later, it's like the cover photo, which apparently seems to be a big deal. I don't troll around in the picture groups a whole crap ton. Like I do, I've, I've joined a lot of them and I'll look at things here and there when it comes across my timeline, whatever. But you guys know me, I don't social a lot. I'm not a big social media guy. So I thought, oh man, that's pretty cool. But apparently it's kind of sort of a big deal because like the picture that the admin put up there had like, and, you know, posted it with, you know, like new group, new group, uh, new page header by Justin Minor, whatever. And there was like, at least within the first few minutes, 10 or 12 people comments. And there was like, congratulations. Like, apparently this is something people aspire to. And that's pretty cool. Like, that's why I got so tickled in myself. I was like, man, I just threw this out there because I thought it looked like it came out to be a pretty nice picture. Um, and I, I do, I, I sort of kind of belittle myself in a way. Like I set up that shot. I knew what I was looking for. I went and found it. I took multiple versions of it to try to get the shot I wanted, but it still is, was kind of a one-off thought. I didn't even think about going to that bridge when I went on this adventure, but it's also another great example. You get somewhere, you get on site, you start making your adventure and doing the things you've planned. There's always little side tangents. There's always little trips that come up, opportunities you can take. And every once in a while, they pay off big, like getting a really, really good picture that that you can put in your portfolio that you're really going to enjoy. When you get old someday, like I remember when I took that picture, I remember how damn cold it was that night. I remember getting, you know, it making the, the, the header of that Facebook page or whatever, like just the funny little things like that. Those are good memories. Those are good things. That's why I always say, keep your eye open when you're on your adventures, because there are things that are always going to come up for you to check out. And that was one of them, man. That was a great one. And then I go back to the hotel and, you know, go to put it on the iPad or whatever. But one of the things I noticed, if you walk down behind that hotel, just FYI, if you guys ever go and make a pilgrimage to make a trip similar to this one, the stars from that bluff behind that hotel at night are incredible. Even though you're in town, they are still very, very visible and absolutely beautiful. And um, there's just so many ways to wrap up your night in a solid way, especially if you're doing this in the summer. I could really see enjoying shooting pictures of the Milky Way off that bluff behind that behind where you're staying at there. Um, but all together... It was a really great trip, guys. Like, I needed something to kill a couple of days where I wasn't going to have my daughter and everyone that I know was going to be occupied with their friends and family. And to stave off getting all depressed, sitting at home on a holiday with no family, you know, I just continued my tradition that I've come to look forward to every year. I put together an adventure I could afford in a time span that I had available. And I went and got to get a ton of content out of this, a YouTube video, several awesome pictures, an entire podcast ap episode out of it. And it was a, it was a rousing success. Like for what I hope my trips will be to keep me moving forward, not just avoiding getting depressed, sitting at home alone, more so than that, being productive and furthering myself, trying to further my prospects in this world and the things I care about, trying to learn more, trying to expand my mind, expand my catalog, expand my portfolio, the things that I love to do, the things that speak to me. And so 
with that in mind, it was a hundred percent rousing success. And for any of you out there that don't have YouTube channels or podcasts, still a trip worth your time, y'all. Still a trip worth your time. So much to do. So much to do. History, beautiful hiking, tons of photograph, ton, tons of photographic opportunities, and you know, if you're the fishing kind, plenty of fishing. Lots and lots and lots to do. And hey, y'all go. If you ever get up there, go check out the Cotter Bridge at night. Even if it's not Christmas, I'm sure the way it's lit, it's probably an incredibly beautiful span to photograph. Anyway, wow, guys, that was an hour and five minutes of me droning on and on again. Glad that you came back to listen, and I appreciate it. If you guys are out there and you're still listening, please continue to share it with your friends. We're catching on, guys. We're getting listens. Like, we're going somewhere with this. We're getting there, and I'm really happy about that. And I owe it to you guys who are sharing it with your friends, telling people about it. Those of you who have gone and rated and reviewed and subscribed to follow us um, and to get the get the episodes as they drop, I... Implore all of you, anyone that I can and trouble you for, to go and leave a review. Like, they mean so much to bump us up in the ratings so that more people, we are more discoverable. That is the word to use. We are far more discoverable discoverable the more ratings we have. So I'd appreciate any and all of you that go and leave us a review. Um, If you guys want to get in touch with us, as we always talk about, if you've got stories that you want to tell, if you've got a trip you know, itinerary that you have done that was just killer. And every week you listen, you're like, God, I need, man, I I, I could do what he's doing. I could, I could tell this story or I want my story told. Send it in guys. My wayward story at gmail.com. We will give you full credit for your story. If you've got a website or a blog or a portfolio of your photo photography, I will gladly shout you out point out who you are and where to find you so that you can get some exposure for yourself as you go along. Um, Other than that, go to the website. If you guys want to find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all that good stuff, it's all at the website, waywardstories.com. And also the YouTube. Don't forget about YouTube. If you want to see the stuff I just talked about for an hour, if you want to see it with your own eyes, go over to youtube.com forward slash waywardstories and you can see the trip that I just took and spoke about at length. Until we meet again. You guys go out there, find something good to do in the world, and don't forget to be good to each other.